All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I am your host, Nathan Holritz, and it's good to be back. Happy Monday to you. Um, I hope you had a great weekend. We actually had some sun in the area. There's a little bit of sun outside right now. Uh, it's refreshing to actually see that despite all the cold, and I hope you found a little warmth in one form or, or another over your weekend. We're going to get into a busy week this week with a podcast. We've got four interviews coming up, one of which, uh, of course, is with Ashley. I'm going to introduce Ashley Strickland here in just a little bit. But before we get started, for those of you that may be live streaming now, make sure that you follow us on Instagram.com slash Boca Podcast. It's B-O-K-E-H podcast. <laughs> you can tell it's been a few days since the last time that we did a podcast here. Got to get back into the swing of things. And then for those of you that are live streaming, do do join the conversation today. Ask questions, comment. You can send us funny emojis if you'd like to. And then for those of you that are listening to the audio version of this after the fact, don't hesitate to come join us. If you follow us on Instagram at Boca Podcast, you'll be able to stay up to date as to when the next live stream is. And you can come join the conversation with our guests, ask questions, comment on the conversation at hand. We're covering a wide variety of topics around running a photography business and would love for you all to be part of that. So don't be shy, come join us. And uh, again, make sure you follow us on Instagram at Boca Podcast. And then last quick note before I introduce Ashley, as I promised you all I would do before every podcast episode, I made my donation to Charity Water today. Charity Water is an organization that I've been giving to for years. You can see a little screenshot of the receipt there on, on, on screen, but I just promised you all I would do this before every episode. And it was a good way to kind of push me to look for opportunities to give. And we can do this in our local community, international, national organizations. So take advantage of those opportunities this week and beyond uh, to give, to donate to your local community and beyond. All right. Well, enough of my introduction today. I want to introduce our brand new guest. Ashley Strickland is with me. Ashley, thanks for coming to hang out with me today. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And we managed to kind of work through some technical difficulties here. And uh, I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit rusty. Like I, it's been a little bit since we've done a podcast. So thanks for being patient with me too. Listen, no, you're not rusty at all. You breeze <laughs> right into it. <laughs> we're gonna, well, we're gonna make it happen, and we've we're actually covering a really interesting topic today. Mm -hmm. And as I think back through 550 episodes or so, I'm not even sure that we've we've spent a whole lot of time. Maybe one or two other episodes that we've spent time on risk management when it comes to running a photography business. It sounds a little bit nerdy, but the reality is we all need to be paying attention to this topic if we want to run a successful photography business, right? Exactly. And look, I'm a proud nerd here. I love talking about insurance. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right there with you. So we're going to dig into that topic here in just a little bit. You have a background in, in insurance and, and we'll kind of get to know a little bit of that background in just a few minutes. But first and foremost, you're a photographer. And by the way, a really talented one, I have to say. So I, I want to share. You. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I want to share your website. I'm going to pull this up here really quick on screen. For those of you who are live streaming, you can see this. If you go to Ashley Nicole Photos dot com just like it sounds ashley nicole photos dot com and then the same thing ashley nicole photo photos rather atl on instagram and i've popped this up on screen as well but yeah ashley your your work is beautiful we'll make sure to link to it i appreciate that oh no truly truly um and we'll make sure to link to it in the in the show notes of podcast dot com but the first question that i normally ask here on the show has to do with brand position you're in the atlanta market not too far away from me i'm here in chattanooga and yes um, it, the Atlanta market is a big market. It's a competitive market. And so I'm curious what, how you position your photography brand to stand out there in that very busy market. Um, so you hit the nail on the head. Atlanta is a very, I guess you can say saturated market. Um, I like to focus on the joy um, of the wedding day. Um, I like to give my clients a good mix of both. So they get a little bit of what's trendy, but they also get those images that are more timeless, that are more loving and emotional. Um, and I also really try to focus on customer experience and my client experience. Okay. Um, and that kind of helps me stand out above the rest. And why do you think that is? I mean, is, is there a tendency for people just to be treated like another number amongst photographers there in a really busy market? Is that what makes your personal customer experience stand out? Yeah, a lot of times, even with talking to people um, in their initial consultations, they don't feel like the photographers that they speak with really try to get to know them. Um, and I feel like that was even my experience um, getting married in 2009. Um, I just didn't feel like my photographer really tried to get to know us. Um, and I know for my husband and I, 
even me, I'm good behind the camera, but you put me in the front of the camera, I'm a rock. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I can relate to you. I don't yeah. know what to do. Yeah. So I enjoy or I need someone to help me relax and to, you know, help me feel like we're just kind of old friends talking. And that really mm -hmm. kind of helps that emotion come out. So I feel like a lot of people don't really see that even help with posing. A lot of um, people I um, talk to, they say they're they seem like they're expected to know what to do. Um, in front of the camera and it's a totally different ball game here because i wouldn't know what to do so yeah it's just such a great point and you know i've, I've been to countless workshops photography workshops mm -hmm. and even at these workshops where you think photographers might be in their prime more comfortable they're, they're even working with models they still don't tend to communicate to the, the subjects that they're photographing in that case. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine, unfortunately, what that translates to back home when they're actually working with their real clients. It is so important that we actively engage with those people that are in front of the camera, because in most cases, even if they are photographers, to your point, they're not going to be comfortable having that camera just pointed at them and just hearing click, click, click. Or in the case of mirrorless cameras, you barely even hear anything, right? So you don't even hear it. Yeah. It's this awkward <laughs> silence, kind of a weird situation. This is a really great segue, though, actually, to my next question, uh, which has to do with customer experience. How would you say that you prioritize customer experience for your clients? What, what creates a more personalized customer experience for your clients? So the first thing I know is to, for me, is actually listening to them. Um, you know, like say for instance, when we do these consultations, we have our laundry list of questions that we, we ask. And sometimes I feel like it can just kind of be repetitious for us. We're not necessarily stopping and listening to them, um, finding ways to um, create more conversation off of what they say to really kind of get to know them and kind of since that connection, like I said, we're interviewing them, but they're also interviewing us. So finding ways to really kind of pull um, out more of their personality to make sure. sure that you can kind of connect with them better. I feel like that helps a lot. So I'm curious how you do this, because uh, honestly, a lot of photographers say that they focus on personal relationships. But I wonder what mm -hmm. that actually looks like, especially in a practical level. Right. Yeah. We, if, especially if we have a lot of clients, if we have an, an, a, an established business where we're working with you know, a large number of clients over the span of a year, for example, it might be easy to kind of go into this robotic mode where we are saying the right things. We're going through the laundry list of questions, like you said, but it's easy to avoid being super personal. How do you make the conversation more personal, make them feel seen and heard? Um, for me, one of the things is slowing down um, because like I said, it is easy to kind of just kind of go through everything, but it goes back, I guess, to just listening. If they say that they got, engage with I can see like you can even watch people so like a consultation I just had a couple weeks ago as soon as I asked them like oh well how did he propose they both they both burst out laughing and I could tell it was this funny story there so I kind of kept trying to poke and pry making little jokes you know you can kind of feel the room yeah. um, just a little bit but actually showing interest um, yeah. and I didn't realize I mean I'm I'm a naturally nosy person maybe I should say inquisitive <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I have to say I you know what I, I gotta interrupt you really quick you bring the <laughs> best energy and I I've mentioned this on social media well, leading up you. to our interview today, but you truly bring the best energy. So I can only imagine that that really sets the tone for, for clients. Does that just come naturally for you? I think it does. Cause I can okay. just have fussed at my children five minutes ago and then because <laughs> I'm able to kind of shut off. If you didn't do anything to me or create, you know, the tension, I can shut it off and okay. just kind of be on and focus on you. So that may just be a, a, a God given, you know, talent, but yeah, I just try, I realize that it's, People's time is valuable. They've blessed me with whatever time they've given me. I just try to make the most of it. And I like to get to know people, even if they don't book me. It's just fun meeting people in love, yeah. hear them talk about their stories. Like I said, I think that's that nosiness that kind of comes out a little bit. <laughs> uh, we'll call it but, curiosity, um, right? Like, I think- There you go. I think but life... I, I am, yeah. No, please go ahead. No, I, I, I am. And I feel like a lot of it, Starting from that initial consultation all the way to their actual wedding day, all of those conversations, all of those forms that I have them fill out that helps me get to know them, it really helps me do my job well on wedding day. Um, so I know, for instance, there's some questions on a questionnaire that I may ask a couple. Who's the closest to you? And sometimes it may feel like dumb questions or things that they may not even um understand but on wedding day it helps me to know okay well i'm closest to my 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 half sister or my middle sister that way i can make sure on wedding day i'm taking photographs of the people that matter most um even when i do their engagement session i try to make it more like it's just kind of old friends catching up um so i do ask a lot of questions about how the process is going what's your family like how many siblings do you have all of this stuff helps me 
on wedding day to know who to pay attention to and who to make sure I capture images of. Well, I, you're, you're good at creating an environment in which people can feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. I, I know this doesn't necessarily come natural for everybody, but mm -hmm. I think it's super important for photographers to be intentional in creating that environment. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of photographers argue that they're introverts and that's fine. We have certain mm -hmm. tendencies that come natural, whether we feel like they're a positive or negative trait. But I think it's super important for photographers to be highly cognizant of the importance of creating a comfortable environment and being intentional and, and paying attention, listening, getting mm -hmm. to know those people in front of them, because not only do beautiful photographs make an impact and potentially convert a potential client, but having the or being able to create an environment where somebody is comfortable makes all the difference in the world and and ultimately coercing them, encouraging them to book us as photographers. So um, just really quickly before I keep moving, Ashley, I, you're you're pixelating just a little bit on my end. Can you hear me OK? I see that, too. I hear you just fine. OK, I just checked my Internet connection. I'm the only one here, thankfully. So it should be OK. Should be okay. Okay. Well, it, this is, um, and hopefully we can, things will clear up a little bit. I'll make sure I keep an eye on things on my end. And our producer, Jill, I know she's, she's chiming in as well. Jill, let me know if you see any issues there. Um, if there's any issue with actually being able to hear us, because that is going to be the most important thing. Ashley, it looks like you're starting to clear up just a little bit. So hopefully that'll, that'll keep you better. I turned the Wi-Fi off on my cell phone, so hopefully <laughs> okay. it'll be better. <laughs> no worries. Well, let, let's keep it moving for now. Um, and so I want to get to the next next question. And you mentioned the significance of time. And, and I really love how you appreciate other people's time. This is especially important when it comes to being a photography business owner and having family or those that are closest to us. I know you've got a family, you've alluded to them already. Is there something that you're doing to help create space and time for your family and, and even for yourself as you're running a busy photography business? And of course, also offer education to photographers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. How do you kind of create that space and a, a sort of balance amidst it all? So I will say that is the hardest part. Um, I don't think that I'll ever truly have it perfected. I feel like it's something that I constantly have to kind of audit and reevaluate. Um, but one thing I try my best to do, and again, remember I said I don't do this well, so if you ask my husband, he may say something different. But um, I try to have a cutoff time. I try to stick to my business hours. Um, one of the parts about, you know, working for yourself is setting hours that work, you know, for your family. So I really do try my best to stay within those um, office hours um, and to devote myself to my clients during that time. Afterwards, when it's time to hang out with the kids and be mom and be wife, I try my best to stay away. Now, social media gets um, <laughs> a little bit in there. But for the most part, I do a decent job of working during those restricted hours. And when it's done, put in the, put in the computer away. So just the intention of hours. And it is that... Mm -hmm. I know that my kids, when they were younger, would even kind of hold us account of, accountable to the hours. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, do your kids like come in and say, okay, mom, come on, come hang out with us. And and they don't say, okay, they just walk in. So <laughs> say, say now I wasn't supposed to do something. You would see one of the three come in and wave and, yeah. okay, we need our mom now. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes things happen. Um, like I said, my girls are all young, um, so they still kind of need me. A little bit so sometimes i've learned just to be flexible but the hours that i have created they are strictly honestly when they're not at home <laughs> um so as long as everything goes well with school most people kind of get ashley when they need ashley during that time period well i, I again the simple notion of intentionality when it comes to time management mm -hmm. I, we, we talk about this quite a bit on the podcast and i think it's a good thing um you know i, I do you know who gary vaynerchuk is Yes, I love him. Yeah, well, I do too. And one of the things that I think gets on a lot of people's nerves about Gary is that he repeats himself a lot. And what mm -hmm. I've realized over time is that he repeats himself on purpose. Um, and mm -hmm. one of the reasons that he repeats himself is because he knows and sees actively that these principles that he's sharing, that he knows will have a massive impact if the people listening will apply them he sees that they're not applying them, you know, and it, it's easy to, it's easy to consume the content and, and kind of nod your head and say, yeah, that's a great idea. And then go on about your business and not actually do anything about it. I've certainly been guilty of that, whether I'm reading a book or Same. listening to a podcast or otherwise, but at the end of the day, there are certain basic principles about life and business that don't, 
I, I don't think it hurts to repeat <laughs> on occasion. Mm -hmm. It's good to be reminded of them. And, and I, I think the simple notion of being intentional with our time, creating cutoff points and certain amount of accountability to go along with that is, is really important. But speaking of time management, one of the most impactful ways to manage time is delegation. Um, sometimes in our industry, it's referred to as outsourcing. And of course, this is not just about editing. It could be editing, it could be email management, it could be album design, accounting. I mean, there are any number of different ways that we can delegate in our business. Is this something that you've experimented with, something that you've had some success with? What's been your experience when it comes to delegation? So this is where I could talk for hours and hours and hours um, because I am an avid fan, a loyal, whatever you want to call it for photographers edit. Y'all have <laughs> saved my, oh, you've saved my life. That's um, very kind of you. And of course, in the beginning, oh, nobody can edit like me or what if they can't do this? And listen, y'all took all of that away. It was, the, it's the easiest process. Um, and it really has helped me get my life back. Um, I'm so excited when I can send it off. It, it just feels like, okay, let somebody else handle that. When you bring it, when you send it back to me, everything is in order. Everything is edited perfectly. All I have to do is go in, you know, and make minor like edits to skin that I normally do for portraits. Um, and that's it. Um, it has literally changed my life and been a game changer for me in my business. I would give you every coin I have if I could for you to continue to do that for me. That's super generous of you. And, and by the way, to be clear for everybody listening in, I wasn't trying to set Ashley up for that. I realized Ashley, as I was beginning to ask that question, I'm like, oh, I, I know that Ashley uses photographers <laughs> edit. This certainly wasn't meant to be a commercial, but it's super generous and very kind of you to say those things. And I'm glad the experience has been a positive one. Just a quick follow-up question to that, because I'm curious, you've had such a great experience and you mm -hmm. mentioned that idea of nobody can edit like me. Will you share with our listeners the way that you were able to kind of step beyond that just on a very practical level? Um, so to be transparent, the first time that I used you guys, I was just in a bind. I had way too much going on and I couldn't do it. And I had talked to my husband about it and other photographers. And he was like, look, you, you just can't do it. Just let them do it and see what happens. Um, so it was more of a, I was forced to <laughs> then, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm going to outsource and be the great, the good photographer that does what people <laughs> tell her to do. Um, but when I tell you, I was literally blown away. And after mm. that, I just said, you know, here, take my money. But it was more so, it's definitely not an arrogance thing, but it's a control thing. You know, you want mm. things done the way you want them. You're not used, especially when you start this business, you start it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, you're not used to having help to do any of it. So it is more like it's your baby. You're afraid, you know, of somebody taking your baby um, and not doing what they should with it. But I mean, you guys have just exceeded my expectations. Well, I, if y'all can figure out a way to shoot for me too, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> noted, noted. Well, I, that's super generous, very kind of you, Ashley. And I do appreciate you sharing your perspective too. And I, cause I know with a lot of photographers, when it comes to kind of giving up that control, it can be a tough thing, but at the end of the day, it frees us up to spend time on those things that will actually grow our business number one. And it gives us time to be with family and the important people in our lives too. So I, I think that's really important. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I just a couple more very quick questions and we're going to jump into this conversation around insurance and risk management. So okay. talk to me about one of the most impactful books. This could be a self-help book, business book that you've listened to, that you've read, something that comes to mind. So the very first book that someone recommended to me, I think you've had her on your um, podcast, Ray Whitney, um, with Ray Whitney Photography. When I left my job, um, she recommended this book. It's called The Rise of the Youpreneur by Chris Decker or Duck Decker, Chris Decker. Um, that book was amazing. I still go back and look at things that I've highlighted. It literally gives you a blueprint. It talks about how to market. I'm one of those people. I like things. I need somebody literally to tell me do A, B, C, D, and then clap your hands. Like I, I need something <laughs> to be literal. You know, don't I just tell you. me, oh, market. No. Okay. Well, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, especially when you enter in all the confusion of, okay, now I'm going to be doing working for myself. You know, it was just a lot. That book really helped kind of help me zone in, you know, and hone in on what I needed to do, help me create a plan. And like I said, I refer to it constantly. It's been, um, I've been in business since 2007 and I started reading that book in 2019 and I still refer back to it a lot. That was wow. a phenomenal, um, read. It really was. 
Well, okay. First of all, the fact that you've been in business for 15 years is huge. Well, no, no, no. 2017. Let, ooh, oh, Jesus. 17. I'm okay, sorry. okay. I thought you said seven. Well, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the mommy brain. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. No, it's 2017. Good. Okay, got it. Okay, 2017. So five years, which is actually a yes. pretty big deal in and of itself, too, because that's that hump, right? Like a lot of businesses fail, mm -hmm. I guess, pre five year mark. So props to you mm -hmm. for that. But I, I put this you. up on screen uh, Rise of the Youpreneur, the definitive guide mm -hmm. to becoming the go to leader in your industry and building a future-proof business. Uh, we'll make sure to link mm -hmm. to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. I appreciate you sharing that. And then just one yeah. last quick question for you. We, yes. we talk about photography on the show. And we tend to lean toward the business side a lot more. But when it comes to gear, is there a particular piece of <laughs> camera gear, photo gear, and it could be totally anything, literally, that you've got in your bag that is just a go-to for you that's your favorite? So number one, I'm a Nikon girl. So Shout out. Um, Yes, yes, yes. I, I love my Nikon, but my favorite lens is my 85 millimeter. I will squat and get in whatever corner I can get in to make sure that I use <laughs> that lens. I'm sure when y'all are editing photographers, editing, when y'all are editing my stuff, you're like, she always uses this lens. The That's 85. my baby. That goes everywhere. It's always on my camera. Mm. Um, but no, that, that and I'm a prime girl. Um, I have a couple zoom lenses, but my heart is with primes. I love, you know, how they capture, you know, the images. So those are the 85 and probably any other prime you could think of. I probably have used it or have it in my arsenal. So is that the 85 one? Is, I know that they make a one eight and a one four both, right? Do they it's make a, a one point four. Yeah, the, 1 .4? the 85 one point four Nikon. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll we'll find a way to link to that in the show notes too for anybody listening in who's who's curious. I appreciate you sharing that. I I, I will mm -hmm. say all of my wedding career, I shot weddings for over ten years. I shot with Nikon. Definitely my favorite. I still You're smart man. Smart <laughs> even man. to this day, I mean, like the the camera right now, I'm pointing at it. The camera that's actually filming me here on our live stream is. Don't tell anybody. It's a Canon. Um, I only did oh. it because, yeah, I only did it because the, the <laughs> cameras available, available to me at the time when I bought this, um, I don't think Nikon was making one that had a little screen to flip around. I like to be able to, to be able to see that, um, I got when you. I need to, but I just love the ergonomics of, of an Nikon body. They, they make mm -hmm. sense. Um, and I know I've got used to it, but even now as I, as I've owned this Canon uh, or a number of Canon cameras, I get this, this at this point for years, I just, mm -hmm. the, the ergos on the Nikon just make more sense to me. They're more intuitive. Anyway. Yeah. Shout yeah, out to Nikon yeah. and definitely at 85. Like, yes. Uh, yeah, I love Nikon. They can take all my money too. Them and photographers edit. They can have it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Shout out to photographers edit and Nikon both. Yeah, good combo. <laughs> well, Brittany, I want to, or excuse me, I said Brittany. You said you were talking about Brittany earlier. Ashley, yeah. I want to get, I want to kind of move on with our conversation here. And, and as a segue to this, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your, your website because you have an education site, AshleyNicoleEducation.com. Business and insurance support for wedding professionals. Great and distinct, very clear brand position there. Helping wedding professionals navigate the world of running a business and securing it. I, just the copy on that's beautifully written. Did you write that? I did. Thank you so much. It's really, really well done. Yeah, it's seriously well done. And Thank then um, you. I'll, I'll pop this back up on screen as well. Ashley Nicole Education for anybody listening. And you can see this on screen on Instagram. We'll link to all of this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But Ashley, just very quickly before we get into the topic, give our listeners a brief background, your background in the insurance world before we get into some of the things that they need to be keeping in mind when it comes to this topic. Gotcha. So I have been in the insurance industry since I graduated. I actually got a degree. My degree is in risk management and insurance. Um, and two weeks after school, I started working. So I've been in the industry for 14 years now. Um, I love insurance. I'm, we talked about those nerds. I'm one of those nerds. Um, <laughs> my mom, actually, she's in the insurance industry as well. She okay. um, has been in it for over 30 years. Um, and she kind of got me into it. I was just thinking about what can I do? You know, you go to college and you know, you're told to get your, get your, get your degree and then graduate and then, you know, go work for somebody for 40 years. And I just had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I wanted to do something with business, um, but everybody was doing marketing and accounting and finance. There was hardly anybody in the risk management um, hmm. classes and I took them and I loved it. Um, I did commercial insurance, so I will tell okay. you, I cannot tell you anything about homeowner's insurance. I cannot tell you about your personal auto, but if you have a business and you want to secure it, I'm your girl. Um, but I spent all of my career um, while I was in corporate America doing commercial insurance, doing small 
um, companies to even doing um, big companies. So I kind of got the knack of being able to look at the risk that certain companies have and being able to kind of help them figure out what insurance what works best for them. Okay, that makes sense. So I, I guess I, building on that then, when we think about a photography business, let's just start with misconceptions. I, I like to kind of squelch misconceptions. So with all your experience in the insurance industry, what would you say is one of the biggest misconceptions, misunderstandings, misnomers, if you will, in the photography industry, just based on your conversations that you've had with photographers, when it comes to business insurance and risk management? A lot of them think they don't need it. I don't have enough clients for insurance. Mm. Um, I don't have enough equipment to have to have insurance. The very time, the very minute that you purchase a camera, you need to have insurance on it. The okay. very, before you even shoot your first client, you need to have insurance. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, I think it's general with everybody. People hate insurance for some reason. They think insurance agents are crooks. They, they're out to get them. They don't want to pay, you know, when something happens and all of that's just not true. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have to say my experience for the most part over the years, not just with business insurance, but also personal insurance, uh, car or otherwise, has actually been relatively positive. I know that there well, are the, the horror stories out there, but I can think mm -hmm. back as a photographer uh, working with, um, I think I was working with State Farm at the time. Uh, and this is certainly not a sponsored discussion, but I, we, I had a, a 70 to 200 lens, um, Nikon, of course, that was, I think once was stolen, actually maybe twice stolen, maybe once was broke, broken and the other was stolen. This has been so many years ago, but I have to say mm -hmm. I filed a claim and immediately I, I, they, they sent a check. I mean, literally almost the next day. Um, that's good. It, yeah. yeah. It was just a really great experience. And again, that was with state farm and this was probably 12, 15 years ago, it's been a little while. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. really good experience. You talk about how photographers tend to think that they don't need it early on, but you're mm -hmm. saying absolutely you do, if for yep. no other reason, just to protect that gear that you purchase, because it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. And that way you don't have to spend the time creating a GoFundMe and hoping people, you know, contribute to the link. Because if you, especially early on, you may not have that much money you know saved up for this business so why waste it having to replace your equipment at full cost when you could pay for this small policy where you would literally only have to pay a small deductible to be made right. whole again after something happens yeah it's it, I, again i've had really great benefit from it so i understand but i have mm -hmm. to ask you and this, i'm i guess i'm just totally naive you said go fund okay. me do you see people like creating yes, GoFundMe's to get. I'm so sorry. No, it drives I... me bonkers because I'm like, you could have an insurance policy for this. Yeah, I see GoFundMe's a lot, like especially in the Atlanta area. Um, things have kind of ticked up with us as far as like break ins. So sure. say people, you know, run into the gas station, but they leave their camera equipment in the car mm. or something like that. Somebody goes in and breaks in okay. and they need everything replaced because they don't have insurance. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And I mean, for a basic policy to cover gear, we're not talking about insane amounts of money. When mm -hmm. we think about the peace of mind that comes from knowing that you're covered one, and then two, knowing that you can call up your agent or submit a claim and get that thing taken care of, not have to worry about mm -hmm. the, um, not only the, I don't know that the, uh, busy work of creating a GoFundMe, but I, the idea of asking, having to ask somebody else for, to, to provide mm -hmm. for me after I made the mistake of not carrying insurance. I don't know that to me, that would be kind of embarrassing to have to do. So let's yeah, just talk about it. It is embarrassing and it saves a lot of that. It saves the time, the embarrassment, you know, constantly having to check and see where I am. You know, it, 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 you have a tool here that's fairly inexpensive, um, mm -hmm. to kind of help you keep your business afloat. It just makes sense to use it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So a photographer knows they need insurance now. Ashley said, so they're going to go get it. <laughs> What's the, what are a few key ideas that they should keep in mind when looking for insurance coverage for their business? So definitely knowing how risky you are, um, how much risk are you willing, um, to have your business kind of handle if something was to happen? Hmm. I don't like risk. So I'm willing to pay a little more to make sure that if something happens, that policy is going to kick in and that's less out of pocket. I have to pay for at the time, you know, of, of, of some type of event. Um, so d figuring out if you want to shoulder most of the burden to have your insurance policy a little cheaper, 
Um, or if you would like that insurance policy to cost you a little bit more so when something happens, you don't have to come out of pocket as much. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is thinking about the cost. Um, how much equipment you have how much are they telling you um that it might run you to cover um this equipment like i said for photographers the policies are ridiculously cheap um especially if you don't have a studio if you have a studio of course that's a whole different ball game but even then photographers their their risk level is fairly low compared to say a roofer <laughs> sure. or someone else yeah <laughs> right. yeah um and the other thing to pay attention to what i like to tell people to pay, pay attention to um, and I may get some, some hate for this, but when you're looking for an insurance, um, company, I always suggest people go to an agent, go to an agent that has the option of looking at several different companies instead of going straight to state farm or straight to travelers, um, go to an agent that is able to touch state farm travelers, the heart for all these different companies. And basically what their job is to take your information and then they'll send it to market and see who can give you the best deal, the best bang for your buck, and the best coverage. Um, I feel like that helps a little bit. And then when it's time to renew, they can look and see, okay, hey, I think it's best for Nathan to stay with State Farm or this year, traveler's rates are looking a little better. They're offering a little more coverage. I may need to move Nathan's business to travelers. Interesting. Do you recommend that we that, that photographers review their policy, say on an annual basis for that very reason, because rates can change? Yep, and it's not even just rates. Sometimes companies, they, they change what they um, are deciding to cover. So, for instance, um, drones. A lot of companies don't like to cover drones. They will throw a, a drone exclusion on your policy. And so if you have a drone, if you decide to buy one, you're thinking that it's covered, and they've got that little piece of paper in your policy that says, no, we don't want that. Um, it could be one year they decide to cover the drone, the mm. next year they decide that they don't. Yeah. So um, companies are always looking at how their, um, what their risk is and what the losses have been for the prior year and years before, and they constantly make changes to the policies that they offer. So that's why I always suggest getting an agent every year, you can kind of sit down, you know, figure out what's changing your business, what your sales are, what you've purchased, you know, what you've gotten rid of, and then just having them kind of constantly look at it for you. Okay. Wow. I, I love this. I, and this is super practical. So I really appreciate this, Ashley. So I'm, I, I was literally taking notes. I've got my notebook here and <laughs> writing things down as we're talking. So I'm going to go back here. The first point you made was to be clear about how much risk you want to take. And I know that I'm guilty of not certainly in, insur in the case of insurance, probably more often just in life in general, if I'm ordering something off mm -hmm. of Amazon or I'm you know, going to go to the store and buy whatever, I, I tend to buy in many cases just the cheaper thing because that's the cheaper thing, right? Like I don't want to spend mm -hmm. as much money here. And the reality mm -hmm. is in many cases, I'm probably going to pay for it down the long run if I buy the Later cheaper on. thing up front. I know that there's something to be said for, again, that peace of mind that comes from, okay, I paid a little bit more of a premium. Mm -hmm. I was able to easily cover that premium up front by just charging enough the services that I offer as a photographer. Mm -hmm. But now I can rest assured that if anything happens, I'm not going to go through this highly stressful experience where only a percentage of you know whatever the cost is of covering this thing that happened um, is covered. And I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, I personally, as a photographer, would just want that. I, I know that and I can't remember the exact premiums that we paid, but we had good coverage and it paid mm -hmm. to have that good coverage when something happened a few times, you know, two or three times or whatever, that something happened. So, so nice to have that in place. So I think that's a great recommendation. Consider the risk mm -hmm. that you're willing to take and mm -hmm. what that's worth to you, the peace of mind that it that may be worth yeah. to, to pay that little bit of extra. And you, if you think about it, like we worry about so much, are our clients happy? Do they like the photos? Did I shoot this right? Is this blurry? Like, you know, did I respond quick enough? Why worry about, you know, if something happens to your equipment or if somebody steals it or it, you get in a fire or whatever, why worry about what's going to happen then? Just, you know, it, it just helps to, it's, it, it's another, I look at it, I guess you're, you're outsourcing your risk. You know, we outsource mm. the photos, um, the photo editing, outsource this. I, that's a really great way to think about it. Okay. And so then number two, you talked about costs and considering mm -hmm. the equipment that we need to actually cover. Have you found that photographers um, tend to overlook the equipment that needs to be covered when you, when you, you're talking about the significance of cost and covering equipment, I guess maybe a better question is how, how should photographers approach that process of making the list, making sure that everything is completely covered? 
So I like to keep a spreadsheet. And actually, if you go to my website, you can download um, either an Excel version or um, just a regular version if you want to print it out and write it down. Okay. But it's literally an equipment schedule. Um, so every, t for me, every time you buy a piece of equipment, you need to make sure that you have some type of catalog or some type of registry so that you know the make and model, the date it was purchased, um, how much you paid for it, um, whatever the, the physical features, if it's a 70 to 200, if it's blacks, whatever. So that way, when something happens or God forbid, if something happens, um, you have a running list of exactly what you have so that you can readily just hand that over to an insurance company. Mm -hmm. A lot of insurance companies, when you actually have your policies, some of them won't ask you to give them an itemized list of your equipment, but a lot of them do. Um, and that helps even when it's time to move different companies or to kind of shop and, you know, figure out who has the best coverage for you just to be able to hand something off to someone to show them, hey, this is what I have. It helps tremendously. Um, for instance, I'm in my home office right now. If my house was to burn down, it, I might be able to go through and tell you exactly, you know, what I have. But as far as like serial numbers, um, how much everything costs, it's easier just to be able to have something like that in yeah. one place. So that I can just pull it off and show it to somebody. What it's basically it's one less stress during a stressful time. Basically, you're just kind of setting yeah. yourself up to have peace of mind later on. That makes sense. And if we if we do that on an ongoing basis, if we buy an item, we just add it to that spreadsheet or add it to the list, the document. It's not like it takes a lot of time to do that thing. And then to your mm -hmm. point, we have the peace of mind, the ease of mind. If something happens we can easily pull that information and share it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've mentioned this yeah. on the podcast before, but I, I keep just super detailed. I have almost 17,000 documents actually in, in Evernote. I use Evernote for my note taking and document yes. tracking. Yeah. And, and of course this is a place where we could put a list like we're talking about, but when, when it came to uh, managing information, receipts, documents, et cetera, for the sake of taxes, um, I've actually been audited a couple of times and it made mm -hmm. it so much easier when I could just say, yeah, here you go. Here's all the documents yep. because I had it yep. there and I had stored it there. And it's, it seems a little nerdy, maybe it seems a little bit tedious, but if we just simply do those things on an ongoing basis, it makes it so much easier if we ever face a situation like that. I think that's a really great reminder. And then the third thing that you mentioned, Ashley, you said to go to an agent and I, I put it, go to an agent for a sit down conversation, which I, I think <laughs> is really great because you know, this day and age where we can get an app where we can just go to a website and quickly mm -hmm. um, apply for something to actually sit down and have a conversation with somebody who knows what they're talking about, like yourself. I mean, the, the way that you communicate is is so easy to understand and so easy to follow and for myself not understanding insurance i would love a conversation with an agent such as yourself who could break it down for me in a way that's easy to understand i think that's really important for the sake of context yeah. and making sure we get the best coverage possible and i think you hit the nail on the head now it's so easy just to go online fill out a little you know questionnaire they ask you what your limits are you're picking limits that you don't even really you know you haven't even yeah. really thought about to know if this is what i need or if this is enough mm -hmm. um and then they issue you a policy and you think oh i'm covered and then this is i guess this is part of the reason why people don't like insurance companies or they have problems with it you think you're covered and then when something happens you realize that this policy that you went online and created is actually not adequate or it doesn't have any of the coverages that you need. Right. Um, so that's why I always tell people, and I hate to say it, but in my opinion, stay away from it. Take Some things are okay to kind of advance with technology and all that, but for the very beginning, um, take it old school. Get on the phone with somebody. Talk to them about your business. Tell them what you right. do. Even, for instance, with photographers, a lot of photographers are now teaching. That's something that your insurance company needs to know. They need to know that you have this other branch um, even if you don't go out and start a whole new company, um, but just let, like, for instance, me, I've let my insurance company know Ashley Nicole education exists. This is what Ashley Nicole education does. Are you going to still cover me or do I need to get a whole nother policy for this? Yeah. It's just a whole bunch of things that we do um, that we don't necessarily think about. I always like to tell people, consider your insurance company your best friend or your best um, business friend. When something good happens, you tell your business bestie. When something bad happens, you go, you know, vent to your business bestie. Look at your insurance company or your insurance agent as the exact same thing. When, when you add a piece of equipment to that equipment schedule, please also tell your insurance company, too, yeah. that you want to add this effective, you know, whatever date. A lot of companies give you some leeway. Generally, it's about 30 days. Okay. Um, but depending upon how strict um, or how rigid your insurance company is, they may tell you if something happens, if it's been after that 30 days, that they won't cover it. 
Interesting. Okay. So we just need to be proactive in making sure we share that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's really, really good. So we have insurance coverage that, that we're going to assume now. Ashley recommended we get insurance. We went and got insurance based on Ashley's recommendations. And now we are covered, but it doesn't mean it's a free for all, right? We're going to go on a shoot. We're going to go photograph a client, whether it's a session or a wedding or whatever it might be. There are certain ways that we can help kind of mitigate risk, even in the act of photography itself. And I know mm -hmm. that you've got a few points to share in that regard. What are those? Yes. So basically you have to, number one, pay attention to your surroundings. But I know like we have this eyes. I've done it before. I'm out driving and I see this little alleyway and I'm like, ooh, I could get some really dope shots <laughs> in this little alleyway. But if I'm going to shoot in this little alleyway, there are some safety precautions that actually kind of needs to think about. Number one, and this one is more so for the ladies. I always tell people before you leave your house, if you're going to my girls, if you're going to bring your purse with you or something like that, throw it in the trunk. Don't get to your location and actually put your purse um, or belongings in your trunk and then go shoot. You think nobody's watching? I know several people who have done that and then they come back and their trunk has been broken into and their belongings have been taken. Um, I try not to even carry a purse or some extra bag. I do have my camera bag, of course. Um, another tip that I always tell people in your camera bag, if you're only bringing your camera bag, don't put your keys, don't put your phone, don't put your wallet or your cards or whatever. Don't put them in that bag because if you're out shooting and somebody comes and snatches that bag, they literally took everything with them. So I may put the keys in my pocket, um, have the debit card in another pocket, the phone, you know, somewhere else, wherever. Um, but don't put all of your items together. Um, so that way, if, like I said, if somebody was to take that, they're just getting your insured equipment. They're not taking anything else if it's more of a snatch and grab. Um, Makes sense. The other thing that I always tell people to do, um, and this is more so for photographers, when you go shoot, don't bring extra or SD cards that have somebody else's pictures on them. Anything that has been used, that hasn't been edited and it hasn't been submitted to the client, leave that at home. So show up to the shoot with clean SD cards, Preferably a camera, of course, that has the dual clock, a card slots and actually put the SD card, the two cards in the card slots. I know a lot of people, they shoot with dual slots, but they'll only put one card in oh. and then get home and then something end up happening to that card. Okay. Um, so that's just another thing to think about. But basically, the point is, if you are out somewhere that is away from your home, literally just kind of survey the area and think about things that you can do to ensure that you and your clients um are safe there as well. Um, a funny story about this, I don't know if I have time to tell you, but I have a um, photographer, a photography mentor. Um, and when he started out in business, he was at a wedding and he was at, I'm sorry, he was at a hotel shooting um, a wedding and he took the dress and he hung it from the, um, the fire extinguisher or the fire, the sprinkler system. Oh no. And nothing happened when he, you know, shot, he got his, you know, we always look for those epic dress shots. So he got his epic dress shot, but at when he left and literally when he was on his way to um, the ceremony, the sprinkler system went off and I think two or three floors um, all had damage. So you have all these guests, all of this, um, these fixtures, all of this stuff that in essence got ruined and they were able to look back at the camera and they saw him hanging it and he got on the hook for that. And I think he said oh, it was like a $45,000 wow. claim. <gasps> so Whoa. had he not had insurance... That forty five thousand dollars could have definitely ended his business. Um, and I think the plan, the, the, the policy that he said he had, he had no deductible. So he literally paid nothing. The insurance company took care wow. of all of that. So can you imagine somebody telling you, oh, it's forty five thousand dollars worth of damage. Your insurance company said, oh, we got it. You keep shooting. Do you know, do what you have to do. Um, so things like that happen all the time and we don't necessarily think about them. Um, but that is another thing too. thinking about what you're doing before you do it. They may not have been, and he admits, you know, that may not have been the best decision to hang it there, but I know I probably made some risky decisions as far as, <laughs> far as you know, yeah. trying to get a certain shot, you know, asking people to do something, having somebody jump up on a ledge or, you know, anything like that. Those insurance policies, they are there to help you in case the unexpected does happen. Yeah. Bonus tip. Don't hang the dress <laughs> from the sprinkler. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great idea. Wait, so in that situation, would that have been liability insurance that, that covered that? That's or? liability insurance. Okay. It's general liability insurance. It is. Yeah. And it, I know yeah. it's a loaded topic, but we should mention at least that it, having a photography business, buying insurance, it's not just about the gear. It's also about having that liability insurance. 
And so I, li I really like to talk about this because I feel like a lot of people think that, yeah, like you just said, I just need liability insurance because, of course, a lot of venues require us to have liability insurance before we can go mm. on site with them. Um, and all I need is equipment um, coverage. One of the, biz the biggest misconceptions that I find that people have, especially regarding general liability, they think that general liability is going to cover you if something happens to someone's images, if you lose their images or God knows what else. Um, general liability doesn't cover for that. That type of policy is a professional liability policy or hmm. something that's called errors and omissions. So in essence, okay. if you have some type of error or if you didn't do something correct professionally, that professional liability policy kicks in. So in essence, if I lost someone's images, that that policy would kick in for that. General liability doesn't cover, general liability doesn't cover that. So that's why wow. I say it really helps to talk to somebody to yeah. know what policies I need. For instance, there's another thing. A lot of people think, well, I don't own my, my business doesn't own um, a vehicle, so I don't need commercial auto or business auto insurance. Well, if you have a second shooter who is shooting for you and say they get into a car accident um, on the way to the wedding, they could, if they really wanted to, they could come to you and say, hey, you know, I was doing this, you know, during your business time. I want you to take care of, you know, my wow. vehicle. Yeah. Um, and you would have to have insurance for that. And that type of insurance, that would be cons what's considered higher than non-owned. So basically a vehicle that you don't own, um, but that is doing business for you, that would technically be co covered there. So wow. it's a lot of little things that you mm -hmm. can have. Um, mm -hmm. There's cyber insurance. If somebody hacks your website, you know, if you keep um, credit card numbers or something, a lot of us can do automated, you know, payments and all of that. If you, if somebody gets access to that, a cyber liability, li a cyber liability policy covers that. So like I said, there's a ton of stuff you can get. You can be as armored up as you want to be, um, but you just really have to talk to somebody. And I feel like you yeah. would get more out of speaking to someone instead of just going online, clicking a couple of buttons. When you talk about auto too, like I think back to when I was shooting, there were a number of occasions where going from say the wedding venue to maybe mm -hmm. an offsite location where we were going to do portraits, maybe the bride and groom jumped in the back of our car for that trip over. If something happened, mm -hmm. we got in an accident while they're riding with mm -hmm. us. Um, the liability is associated with that. Would that be under, would that necessitate mm -hmm. that type of auto coverage? And the thing about it is, all of it really depends on your insurance company. I hate to make to say that, but it really does. Um, even for instance, if something was to happen in your home, a lot of people, they try to rely on homeowners insurance to cover it. A lot of companies, if they find out that you have a business and it makes like over a certain amount, if it makes over a thousand dollars, some say five, some say 10, they are going to tell you that, okay, this is its own entity. We're not covering it. You would mm. need your own separate policy. So some insurance companies, they will, and not that it's them trying not to pay, but I think, I mean, we live in such a litigious society. So many people, you know, try to go to your insurance company, you know, to get payouts. So they do it as a protection mechanism um, to kind of say, this is what we're going to do and this is what we want. Yep. Um, so I feel like in that, you really have to do your due diligence to make sure that you're making sure that your business has the policy and the coverages that it needs. So that way you don't have to have the headache if something does happen for somebody to tell you, okay, well, we're not going to cover that. Also, word of the day, litigious. That's a good word of the day. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love it. This is okay. So this is good. I, I want to jump back really quickly though, um, to, to the points that you, you're making about when photographers mm -hmm. actually go to a shoot. Number one, pay attention to the surroundings, and and this could be applied in so many different ways. Whether it's a you know an alley like you were describing, I can't tell you the number of times that I went and photographed in a in an alleyway downtown Chattanooga. But like mm -hmm. you're saying, especially for women, pay attention to the surroundings. Make sure that you're keeping yourself safe. Just generally speaking, this would also be applicable in a situation where maybe we're taking our clients to um, an area that could be potentially dangerous. I mean, I, I know that I've photographed mm -hmm. clients countless times up on the mountain here in Chattanooga or one of the yep. mountains. And if you're mm -hmm. near the edge of a cliff, um, obviously, I mean, it, it, it seems like it would go without saying that we need to be careful, but these types of things we have to pay close attention to just generally speaking. Yeah. But, but then when it comes to valuables, this is interesting too. being super cognizant about where we're placing our valuable valuables, mm -hmm. Um, whether it's not placing them in the trunk where everybody can see it, that see that we're doing that or you know, breaking up a wallet and uh, maybe keys and, and dip, putting them mm -hmm. in different locations that aren't so obvious, just being super cognizant about how we're managing our valuables. I think that's really, really great. 
And then the other thing that you mentioned too, and this is, this is, I love this, the practical nature of this, not bringing clients images with us on a shoot for a different client. Again, it mm -hmm. seems like it would almost be an obvious thing, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're managing, you know, hundreds, thousands of images for various clients. And the last thing that we need to do is to bring that on a shoot, lose it on that shoot or get stolen. And yeah. now we can't take care of those, those clients images because we don't have them mm -hmm. backed up. So I, I, I love the intentionality and the practicality of your recommendations, Ashley, and it really summing it up, like you said, by go and sit down with an insurance agent who can break mm -hmm. the stuff down in detail for you. Think about all the moving pieces there. And because mm -hmm. you could I mean, I know I could easily get overwhelmed trying to keep up with it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at those agents are there. It's not intimidating. They're regular people just like you. Um, and especially if you find a good one that you don't feel like you're bothering um, when you ask questions, yeah. it can really do wonders for your business. Yeah. Um, there are some bad apples, just like there are bad apples in every um, in every industry. But a lot of insurance agents, they really do want to make sure that you're taken care of. Number one, so you can keep coming back. And number two, so that it doesn't spill back on them either. Um, but yeah. they literally legit care about your businesses. A lot of times mm. they want to know what you do. How many clients do you normally see? Um, and that helps them, like I said, find the best coverages for you. Okay, perfect. So everybody listening in, um, if you don't have insurance, go talk to an agent, get set up. If you do, but you haven't updated it in a while, I mean, Ashley's brought up some really interesting points here about things that may or may not be covered based on that particular insurance company's coverage, their policies. So make sure that you go sit down with an agent and take care of that. And then Ashley, I know this is a loaded topic. We've you know, spent less mm -hmm. than an hour here talking about this. If photographers want to learn more from you around this topic, um, share a little bit about the education that you do offer to the industry, if you will. So I offer, number one, um, you can come to me anytime. If you DM me, shoot me an, um, an email. Um, I can talk about insurance all day long. So if you have a simple question, I'm not one of those people that you can't come to and ask me um, a question for. Um, I do offer insurance audits for companies. So say, for instance, if you're one of those people like, look, I don't understand insurance. I don't really want to, but I know I need the help. Um, you can come to me um, and I will do an audit of your business. Um, and basically, I'll go through um, and ask you a couple of questions about your business. Um, I'll review your insurance policy to make sure that the policy that you have and that you're paying for is actually covering your business in the way that you need it to be covered. Okay, um, so cool. that's definitely for those people who are like hands off and they're like, look, just just handle this for me. Um, if you go to my website, there are a couple of free resources that you can get to. Um, I have. Um, a little, you can see it right there. It says five free ways to reduce your business risk. It's basically just a guide for wedding professionals to look at ways um, that they can reduce their risk for free without having to um, incur any additional fees. Um, and they've just got some good blog topics on there. And like I said, you can also go on there and you can get that free download of the, um, the equipment schedule to kind of get you started paying attention to what you have and actually um, keeping a, a ledger of what you have in your business. Perfect. Yeah. And, and for those of you that aren't live streaming with us, I, I pulled up Ashley's site as we were talking. That's what she was referencing. AshleyNicoleEducation.com. Just like it sounds, we'll link to it in the show notes at BocaPodcast.com. Ashley, this has been super practical. Um, I mean, I, I wish you were my insurance agent because I, I would love just sitting down to talk with you. I mean, it, <laughs> if you were in Georgia, I could be. I'm only licensed in Georgia. Okay. Um, but I thank you for opening this up because I, I, it's definitely a topic that's not talked about enough yeah. in our industry. So thank you for giving me the time today. I totally our privilege for everybody listening in. Make sure that you go to the show notes, bocapodcast.com. We'll link to all the resources that we referenced today. Um, if you are not live streaming with us, make sure you come live stream with us. Follow us on Instagram at Boca Podcast, and um, you can keep up to date with the upcoming live streams. We've got three more this week, Ashley. Thanks for starting us off really strong. This has been a great conversation. Thank you thank so much. Thank you for having me. Thank